Ladies and gentlemen, we'll get started. I am very sad to be the first session after lunch. Normally that means everybody's a little sleepy. So I'll try to be as entertaining as possible, have a couple jokes, but I'm here to talk about some very serious topics. And uh, before I begin, let me ask a little question of the folks here in the audience. How many of you are uh, developers or maintainers on an open source or uh, internal project? All right. Um, are you a developer or open source maintainer? Awesome. Who here works in an OSPO, like inside an open source program office? Okay. And other folks, are you in security, application security? You just like geese? Cool. Geese are cool. So uh, I'm here to talk about how uh, maintainers and projects can integrate some uh, ideally simple techniques and tools, and we'll kind of graduate on to some more complex tools to help make themselves be more secure and help make their projects have a better security posture. Uh, my name's Krobe. I uh, do stuff on the internet, and some of that stuff on the internet is I work with an organization called the Open Source Security Foundation. We are an we're a project of the Linux Foundation, and we're focused on trying to uplift the security posture of open source software, all the way with the uh, creators, starting with the developers and maintainers, working through suppliers, and then also trying to help educate and uh, provide tooling and data to downstream consumers so that everybody can create and use open source software more securely. I've been involved in upstream open source security for over a decade. Uh, I get to, uh, anytime there's a big, uh, high-profile, uh, scary thing, uh, think like Heartbleed-style events. Uh, historically, I've been involved in the industry coordination with that, and then in my role with my current organization, I help my organization manage that. And then through the foundation, I help provide advice to our constituents, uh, developers, suppliers, and consumers on how they might need to react to um, high-profile events. Uh, like you all might have heard of a, a tiny little incident in the last couple of weeks uh, with XZ Utils. Um, for those of you that are uh, developers and maintainers, uh, un unfortunately the world is a very bad place and not everyone is uh, happy and friendly and kind of embracing open source ideals and working towards the greater good. There are bad people out there and they very much would like to exploit you your projects and your customers, so to speak, those that your downstreams that are using your software. So uh, XZ was really a wake up call for a lot of folks upstream that they are a target because historically you've heard things like the target breach or attacks like solar winds where commercial entities were targeted by bad actors to uh, exfiltrate data or to take systems down. But now with um, XZ in particular, uh, Upstream maintainers are a target. And ideally, through uh, the work we get to do through the OpenSSF, I'll be able to uh, help arm you a little bit, help you prepare. And uh, it's best to think about some of these things while you're not in a crisis, uh, because you can plan, you can find friends to help, you can get tools or what, you know, whatever you need to do to prepare yourself and your project. But while you're in the crisis and in the fire, you have your project members, your downstream, you have random government people, you have commercial people all harassing you. Are you uh, vulnerable? When are you going to fix it? Why isn't it fixed yet? So we ideally, taking the time when you're not in crisis mode to prepare yourself and your project, uh, you'll have a much better experience if you ever have the unfortunate event like an XZ or a log for shell and these style things. So we're going to talk about the problem. We're going to talk a little bit about what the OpenSSF is, what we do. We're going to talk about specific things that we, uh, resources we have and we can provide and link you to to help arm yourself, prepare for these types of situations. And then we'll talk a little bit about, this is an open source community, how you can contribute back. And I want to uh, state very clearly up front. So within the OpenSSF, I lead the uh, Developer Best Practices Working Group and I also lead the Vulnerability Disclosures Working Group, and I'm the chairperson of the Technical Advisory Council. But a lot of my work within 
upstream is trying to help work with projects and maintainers to help them. And I want to know that uh, a lot of lay people or downstream commercial folks don't understand developing software is very hard. It's you know, a challenge enough trying to solve a problem through software. And then when you try to layer on top, trying to develop software securely is an even harder task because a lot of times, you know, developers, if they were classically trained, like at university, a lot of universities don't teach these ideas or skills. Um, if you're an experiential learner, you might just not have come across the need to, you know, why should I have a fuzzer integrated into my CI system? Why do I care about static code analysis? And so, you know, when you layer on these different techniques and tools to help harden your project from attack and nefarious actors, it, it's exponentially more challenging than just writing, trying to deliver function, features and functionality. And traditionally, um, application security and like security hardening is, is a very niche activity. It, it generally has been the domain of specialists and general common developers don't have access to those tools or techniques or experiences. So again, it's just something that for a lot of developers is kind of outside of their experience. They've never had to think about how do I do a threat model on my software? Like how could somebody break my software? Um, normally, you're focused on the act of creation, not destruction. And that's when in security, you kind of have to flip that on its head and think about how could my software be used for bad? And then you take steps to ideally uh, avoid that. And if you are, um, depending, if you're like our friend uh, Diana, the uh, Weekend Warrior, is a persona I should talk about here in a little bit. Um, if you're working on a project in your spare time, you're kind of doing it out of the goodness of your heart, or you, you, it's a, a passion project, you might not uh, necessarily make that a priority. If you work for a commercial enterprise that is gracious enough to let you work on open source, normally that's on your own time, not during corporate time. And if you're doing it as part of your corporate job, security um, is typically uh, uh, reserved as a non-functional requirement and generally gets pushed so far down the priority list and the backlog that you rarely get the opportunity to actually uh, focus in and try to do it. And if you're thinking about like a product manager, they generally don't care about these types of things. They're focused on the delivery date. You know, when is that feature, when is that functionality going to be delivered? So that's, again, not a priority in generally the folks that may be above you in an organization or even like within a project. You, you might not have ever had the idea that you know, somebody might use my software for bad. Uh, broadly, I kind of chunk upstream software into three buckets. Three broad categories. So on the, the far end here, these are the largest, the oldest, the most mature projects that have been around for decades. These are projects like the Linux kernel. This is the Apache Foundation, Eclipse projects, uh, Kubernetes. These are very large. Typically, they have a lot of professional developers, and it's their job to upkeep this software. And looking at you know, all of the software on the planet, I would say there's probably dozens of this style of project where they'll have um, tens to hundreds of developers, potentially, that participate in that community. Then you move to the next side, the medium-sized projects. And these are projects that you can observe. They have between two and 100 developers that have had commits participated in the project. And I would say the order of magnitude of those style of projects is in the hundreds. There are hundreds of projects on the internet that kind of fall into this bucket. Then the exciting giant blue box here. Uh, we did, uh, my friends over at Anchor, Josh Brescher, did an analysis a few years ago. He looked at uh, PyPy and NPM. And GitHub always puts out a report every year GitHub doesn't represent all the software, but the last time they had a statistic, there were about 16 million projects in their ecosystem. And Josh, through Anchor, looking at PyPy and NPM, found kind of similar numbers. So there are in the order, the magnitude of tens of millions of software projects. They all have a single maintainer. There is a person 
toiling away in obscurity, probably alone, and they might not have friends, they don't have a community or team members that they can lean into that might have complementary uh, expertise. So it's a person writing this functionality, and uh, that's the majority of the software within the open source ecosystem, is this single maintainer type project. Which brings me to my friend, Diane of the Weekend Warrior. Uh, there is a, uh, a, a renowned open source developer, Thomas Dupree. Uh, last year, he wrote a blog, uh, kind of as a response to a lot of the uh, governmental things that are going on around the globe. And the title of the blog was, I'm Not Your Supplier. And I, I'm lucky enough that I have a relationship with Thomas and we've kept in touch. And he actually participates in some of our issues within the OpenSSF. And we had put on one of the projects I'm working on called the Security Tool Belt. Um, he gave us some feedback where we created a set of personas. Like we have a, a structure. We, we saw four developer personas, developer maintainer. We saw three consumer personas. And we saw a regulator persona. And we had a bunch of documentation. And Thomas came along and said, that's cute, but you forgot uh, my, you know, my friend Diana, the Weekend Warrior, which again represents the majority of software on the planet. And Diana the Weekend Warrior, this is a person that generally works on this in their spare time. They are not compensated for this work directly. Uh, they are, are alone. They don't have additional peers to help them on the project. And there's a lot of different motivations behind, behind why developers create software. You know, sometimes it comes out of an academic project or a dissertation thesis. Sometimes it might be the developer has a unique problem they're trying to solve, and they say, hey, I, I solved the problem here, and they want to share that with the, the general ecosystem. I think if I had the problem, others will have it. So this is a lot of different motivations. Some people are professional developers that are paid to do this. But again, there's a, a broad spectrum of motivations on why people write open source software. But Diana, again, is not necessarily compensated for this work. And you know, this particular persona that Thomas helped us create is you know, this person makes a couple small packages and you know, they, they might contribute to a few medium-sized projects. And uh, we get to this section was very telling to us as a, a lot of the members within the OpenSSF are commercial entities. I work for the Intel Corporation. I have partners at Google and Microsoft and all the big high-tech companies. We have security researchers and other people that participate but you know, this was a, a bit of a blind spot to us where we didn't realize kind of the scope and kind of what these people, what probably many of you go through. And thinking about Diana, Thomas succinctly said that you know, Diana has roughly two hours a month that they can donate towards maintenance of the project. And they spend most of their time either updating dependencies and fighting with all the problems that come with that, or they're fighting their tools, that they're trying to get their CI system to work. They're trying to get their testing and automation to work. So the majority of their time is spent on kind of operational things and not that act of creation, that uh, features and functions and responding to your community. So you know, again, the majority of the time of this persona is spent on fighting uh, to try to get their project just to keep it keep above water. Uh, I would ask anyone here, does anyone, do you, either you experience this or do, are you aware of friends in the community that go through this, these types of challenges? Some thumbs up, yeah. So it, it's, it may not be you, but you definitely have, you know of, or heard of people that live this every day. And that's where you know, like the XZ attack, the attacker understood very clearly how open source communities work how we operate, how we embrace contributions. And they also understand how there's a lot of intense pressure to deliver to your, to, you know, to show value and keep the reputation of your project up. And folks can be susceptible to bullying. But again, the, the current state summary is that the majority of software is written by a single maintainer. Uh, there are an untold number of random downstream requests or demands uh, for fixes or security updates. And again, most of the developer's time is not spent on the project. It's things that support the project, dependencies and tool chain. And normally, like learning new security techniques and tools isn't on 
it doesn't make it on the backlog. It doesn't make it above the cut line. So I, I will, part of the work I do is there is some solutions here and there are a group of people that are trying to help address these types of problems through uh, training, best practices, tooling and automation, and just kind of being there as a, a support structure for the ecosystem. Uh, as I mentioned, the Open Source Security Foundation is a cross-industry group of industry members, security researchers, maintainers, uh, government people from around the world, uh, end users. So we have a lot of folks from like large banks or manufacturers that participate in the conversation. And our mission is to try to help improve the security of open source for all users and consumers of it. And you know, we collaborate both with upstream and downstream. And we're, again, we're trying to help advance the security for every participant within the ecosystem in that software supply chain. This eye chart just kind of describes the uh, projects, uh, working groups, and special interest groups that uh, we're involved in. And we're gonna talk specifically today about this box up here. This is the Developer Best Practices Working Group. There's a series of tools, best practices, and other guidance that we're gonna kind of walk through to help maintainers and project contributors help protect themselves. And you know, we have things where we talk about uh, supply chain security, we have the vulnerability group, we're into uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we have a whole kind of risk uh, data and metrics group. So we have a lot of different areas. And that's where, if you take nothing else away, the two things I want you to take away today is there are actionable, simple things you can do to help improve your security today. And then also, there are ways that if you are interested to learn more or to participate, there's a very big community of people around the world that are trying to help this. And we patches and contributions are always welcome. So I'm going to talk about some specifics. Uh, I, I'm not a demo guy, so I'm not going to get in and show you how to integrate uh, the scorecard GitHub action into your workflow. But I'm going to talk about a series of things. Simple. We're going to start off simple, and it's going to gradually build to some more complex things. But there are things that you can do starting today to help protect yourself, help protect your community and project consumers. And uh, the first step is education. And Education gets a bad rap a lot of times. People complain. Uh, the education typically has a very long tail. It's not something you can instantly turn on. But why I put this first is because once you have learned a technique or you learned how to avoid a certain type of behavior, once you know that input validation is useful, you you have that with you all the time. It doesn't matter what company you work for, what IDE you're using, what your source code repo is, you have this knowledge with you everywhere. So I would strongly encourage you. Our group has a free class, like 100% free, that talks about secure, secure development, where we talk about how to identify things, like how to execute input validation, how to avoid SQL injection and cross-site scripting. And we talk about security principles that you should be aware of, like, you know, principle of least privilege, you know, access permissions. So we get, it's a really great introductory class. And especially if either you, A, never have had formal education, or B, maybe it's been a long time and your program that you went through didn't have that, or you're a self-learner, there's some very quick techniques in here. And we're, we have a project right now to augment this class that uh, we're adding in hands-on labs so that you can uh, demonstrate to yourself that you've learned these concepts. And we give you a little quiz to kind of walk through these exercises. Uh, we're battling uh, regex right now, which is a lot of fun. Which spins off, we're going to do a white paper about how regex is not the same in every uh, language and every environment. So that was an interesting fact we found. Yeah, 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 it's crazy. Yeah, really. It's different. It, it behaves differently. So we're going to have a, we, because we need, we're writing these labs, we're spinning off some new guidance to help educate people. But this, is, this class is 100% free. If you, uh, if you work at a company that you might have, uh, like they require continuing education or you want to you know, brag a little bit, there is, oh, no. Well, that's sad. Sad trombone. Give me a moment while I uh, load up my power and see if that helps at all. 
But uh, we have a certification class. So for a nominal fee, the Linux Foundation will give you a test. And you can earn a certificate that you know, go, can go on your LinkedIn profile or into GitHub to say, you know, I did a thing. I learned secure coding uh, concepts. And I've demonstrated some level of capability. And that is uh, you know, depending on what your, uh, what your deal is with you know, your employer or how you work, there's some value in having a certification and some you know, proof that you uh, have learned these concepts. Uh, awesome. So while the slide reboots, and I'm going to unplug because I've got a bunch of security nonsense that will pop up. Uh, Another thing we have is we have a, uh, we wrote a concise guide to developing uh, software securely. And this is essentially a two page white paper in a checklist format that talks about if you do these 15 to 20 things, in general, you're going to create software more securely than people that don't follow them. And we provide links to resources that either um, like we have a C and C++ compiler hardening guide. So we talk about, here's techniques you can use to harden your compilation process. So we, in the document, we say you should use compiler hardening options, and we provide links to those resources so that you can get to it. But again, the idea behind the guide was to present it in a roughly uh, two-page uh, format in a kind of a checklist. And again, everything in there, nothing's required. It's all guidance and suggestions, and uh, some things are, easier than others to pick up, and you just kind of take it and leverage it, use it as a resource as you're moving forward. And uh, yay, Intel security tools, you're amazing. Woohoo! Yeah, it normally takes about five minutes for me to reboot because of all the uh, tools I get to use. Oh, wow. I miss my RHEL desktop. <laughs> also, I, used to, I worked at Red Hat for seven years, and we were, I had a Linux desktop forever, and I loved it, and I miss it. And now I get to use this corporate asset, which is, you know, a thing. That actually came up pretty quick. Where were we? So I talked about the concise guide. Some other amazing things, some great resources that aren't part of the foundation, but if you're in application security, they're excellent references. So OWASP has put out a top 10 uh, coding mistakes list for about 15 years. And every couple of years, they'll refresh it. And like SQL injection has been on the list for a decade. They renamed it, so now it's called something different, but it's SQL injection. So that, that's a good reference to look at uh, you know, am I, are there things within my software, within my workflow, uh, techniques I'm using or libraries I'm using that might fall into this? So the OS Top 10 is a great resource to look at, to refer to, to say, you know, I probably need to avoid these types of behaviors. And then uh, SANS, which is another security organization, they put out the top 25 most dangerous software errors every year. And this is based off of a, uh, a concept called CWE, common weakness enumerator, and it's basically a standardized way to describe the root cause of hardware and software flaws. And so uh, SANS is a great resource you can kind of look to see. Uh, our, our friends at CISA, the US government, like to point to uh, memory safety as a thing. So that's on the, the uh, SANS 25 list. Oh, now my microphone software is coming up. That's awesome. Give me a moment to shut off my uh, mixer software. All right. So that's power of education. You always have education with you. I would encourage you wherever possible. It doesn't have to be formal training. It could be looking at a book, looking at a blog, looking at a concise guide, a checklist. The next step you need to do, and this is where a lot of maintainers have not realized that they are a target of bad actors. But you need to protect your accounts. You, you, you must do this. And the simplest advice doesn't cost you a dime. Never reuse passwords. Uh, every day, attackers are harvesting credentials and passwords. And they will use those, they'll put those into attack dictionary programs where they will just 
brute force in credentials. So the simplest technique you can do to avoid your account being compromised is to not use the same password across multiple systems. Um, alternatively, you could use a password vault tool. So if you have um, a desire, and I would encourage it, to use long and complex passwords, it's not the human mind doesn't react really well to memorizing a 30-character string of numbers and digits camel-cased with symbols. Password Vault is a nice, simple tool. You can get them for free. I suggest maybe paying for a, a reputable one. But that's a, a nice way that you can store your credentials and not have it on a you know, piece of paper on your desk or a sticky note on your monitor. Um, and then, if you are so inclined, Another simple step is to enable multi-factor authentication, sometimes called two-factor authentication. And that's a, um, you've seen Yubi keys or the Titan keys, so you could have like a, a digital key. You could use a, a OTP, a one-time token service, uh, like Google Authenticator. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of things. So that's another technique where basically the attacker, it makes it harder for them to impersonate you and become you because there's this additional step that they normally have to have something physical, um, your phone or a token to be able to log into an account. So that's a step that you can add both into logging into your workstation, your coding environment, and you also can integrate this into your CI workflow, although that does uh, force things into more manual mode. But just depending, there may be certain stages like if you have a, a very regimented release process, potentially before you go uh, hit the commit and merge button, maybe you need to have a, a step up authentication. Potentially, it's something to consider. And then uh, this is something that back at Red Hat, we stumbled on across all the time. Uh, source code repositories are great. Don't put passwords and tokens and secrets into your code and then publish that to the internet because the bad guys are watching your source code. And the minute they see like a S3 bucket key, they will pounce on that and attempt to use it. So just be careful, have good, clean hygiene practices with your code and try to avoid. And there's automated tools that will look for secrets and passwords. So you can add some automation here to pull that stuff out before it gets actually published to your repository. So consider doing that. There are techniques, and depending, again, on, on your project, um, most everyone here uses uh, some type of source code system, GitHub, GitLab, SourceForge, whatever. Uh, you may, and you probably have, a CI, CD system. And if you use either of those two things, there's additional security considerations you need to take. You know, out of the box, they aren't uh, bulletproof and uh, safe by design. You have to go in and make adjustments. That's right. You got to sprinkle the salt on it uh, to make it worthwhile. And uh, there's techniques you can use. There's guidance. And if you don't want to read, uh, you know, GitHub's 50-page guide on configuring your repository, uh, the, op the Open Source Security Foundation, we had a project where we looked across GitHub and uh, GitLab and we provided guidance on how you can very quickly configure certain elements of your CI CD pipeline to be more secure, to you know, enable branch protection, to uh, you know, add in a bunch of steps. So this uh, is not a concise guide, but it's about a 10, 12 page document. So if you, uh, as part of your duties in your project, you have some governance or administration over your uh, SCM or your CI pipeline, consider looking at uh, the best practices guide for configuring your source code management. If you are in the NPM environment, if you use NPM and you know, leverage that ecosystem, we have a best practices guide for using that repository. Uh, we also just recently published a, a principles of package repository safety. And what this does is it looks across the major uh, package repositories and uh, talks about these are things you should look for, things that should be enabled if you're looking to you know, house your software somewhere. Um, really good guide. It was co-written between uh, OpenSSF and CISA. And it's something to uh, think about and consider as you're, you're planning out how you're going to 
deploy and uh, provide your software to the world. And again, can be a little annoying, but it is very simple to enable things like branch protection in your workflow so that someone can't come in and clobber what your good work's going on. Very few developers write every piece of software that is used within the functionality they're providing. Typically, you're going to leverage libraries, uh, third-party components, dependencies. Uh, so you're not going to write your own compression algorithm. You're going to leverage some pre-existing art. So th there are some risks in that. And as a developer, as you're making choices for how your software operates and what components are needed to make it run, you need to think through things. Uh, we wrote a, another concise guide. This is about a two-page checklist. And this is focused on both maintainers and downstream consumers. But you know, as a developer maintainer, it's something you need to be aware of is kind of what things your downstream are going to need to make your software run. So the concise guide is a checklist you walk through, and it has 15, 20 things that you can very quickly integrate into your project and your operations to help uh, make checking make sure that the software that you depend on for your software is as secure and as stable and hardened as it can be. We have a couple tools of Scorecard and All-Star. These are ways to provide signaling on the security practices of a project. Uh, Scorecard goes out and looks at um, over a million projects every week, and you'll get security data about this. You know, do they have an SDLC? Do they have multiple maintainers? And we, they publicly provide that information, and that lets you make choices as you're selecting components to leverage that underpin your software. And All-Star is an automated, automated means that you can implement the uh, recommended practices that are in the scorecard and go fix them. Uh, and eventually those two projects are gonna merge. But that's something that you can look at. And then like organizations, like a, as a consumer, uh, I work for the Intel Corporation. We actually use Security Scorecard where we're grading ourselves internally. Every single one of our open source projects, we put through Scorecard to kind of see how far off are we from expected behavior, and we have a, a backlog of stuff we need to go work on and improve. Some things we do great, some things we don't, and uh, you know, we have that backlog of stuff we're working on. So you could kind of take that either into your project or into your enterprise, potentially to leverage Scorecard that way. My dear friend, Dr. Wheeler, just walked in, and uh, an effort that he's been championing forever is we have a best practices badge. And this is more of a uh, interview style tool, whereas a scorecard goes out through automation and looking at uh, publicly observable things, or if you give them access to your repository, they'll scan certain behaviors. Um, the best practices badge is more of an interview and is actually one of the elements that scorecard checks. But if you're interested, you can walk through and uh, see how well your practices within your project rate. Um, David and I have done presentations at a couple of these summits, and uh, both times we've had developers in the room as we're talking, presenting the tool, they'll go through and they've earned the passing badge just because of stuff they're already doing. So it, it is possible uh, the passing badge, is, it's, I wouldn't say it's a low bar, but it's generally fairly common things developers do. And then as you want to uh, increase your eminence, you can go for silver or gold criteria. And you actually earn a badge that goes into your repository saying, you know, Crobe is a certified great guy. He earned a, best, a gold badge for his Crobe project. It's nice to have a little humble brag occasionally. And our presentation, actually, there's a, a video. I believe it's from uh, when we were in Spain but you can see us talking about that if you're interested in kind of learning more. We talk about how to integrate both scorecard and best practice badge into your projects. Um, some simple common things you can do today to help your projects is turning on things like Dependabot or RenovateBot if you're in GitLab. These are dependency checking tools. Uh, they can be a little noisy depending on how well you've managed what dependencies you're using. But uh, these are critical, or these things will give you updates as known vulnerabilities are found in software that you depend on so that you can take action. You can evaluate what I need to do to uh, 
correct that or not. Uh, we have a new tool called Guac, which actually, uh, it's a dependency tree map. It will show you graphically, and I wish I would have uh, stolen the graphic, but uh, it will show you graphically what all the dependencies are, all the components and libraries and other third-party things you're calling out to, and it will visually map that, and then it will allow you to integrate things like software bill materials, uh, VEX vulnerability statements. Um, it'll take ingest uh, CVE data around vulnerabilities. It's pretty cool. And then my pals from Australia, OSV team, they're here. This is an open source security vulnerability database. Um, they also uh, have a list of malicious packages. Uh, and I, I will publish this to the uh, Developer Best Practices Working Group, and all these things are linkable, so you can go do your own research. But OSV is a great open source tool that you can leverage to understand um, if there's any software that you use that has vulnerabilities. Make sure that you have a security vulnerability process. It could be a security text file, a security MD file, and you need to tell the public and your consumers what you will or won't do around a vulnerability. And it's perfectly acceptable to say, we don't do vulnerability management, but that's not great, but you can say that, and as long as you're publicly stating that, consumers can make that evaluation, are they willing to accept that risk? Or you can have a more uh, robust program saying you know, mail us on this private mailing list and we, you know, we'll take a day to triage so you can kind of state what your processes are. And this helps set expectations not only with your consumers but security researchers who might stumble across your project and uh, start sending you nasty grams. And if you have it publicly documented what we will and won't do, that helps make that vulnerability disclosure uh, much more seamless for your project. If possible, and I know with a single maintainer project, uh, team is hard, but think about how you might plan for having, getting security expertise into your project. It could be a friend you, you, in a related project, somebody that took a security class, uh, but you find people that understand how to do uh, defensive coding and are application security experts, build those relationships because you may get a vulnerability that's reported to you that you're not able to replicate or you don't understand. And having that relationship established with a trusted source that can help you triage the thing is invaluable. And if you are lucky enough to have a multi-person project, consider having a security point of contact that has that expertise that is baked into your project. Uh, this is a somewhat controversial topic. Uh, there is a, uh, I mentioned CVE, it's the uh, uh, common vulnerabilities and exposures uh, thing, and it's a way of identifying a unique so vulnerability in software and hardware. There are entities called CNAs, which are CNA numbering authorities, and these are organizations that are authorized to issue uh, identifiers. And where open source has been put into a bind is the majority of open source projects are not CNAs, and they uh, rely upon the CNA of last resort which is someone that has no idea how your project operates, how it could be broken, you know, what security controls you have, and they will issue a, a vulnerability identifier against a project that the developer disagrees with potentially. They feel is not factually ac accurate. And if you are not a CNA or you don't have a relationship with a CNA, it's very challenging to kind of fight that process. So we've had a lot of projects, like a Linux kernel just became CNAs. Um, a couple of folks in the Python Foundation became CNAs, so they can kind of manage how uh, vulnerabilities are issued to and handled within their ecosystem. So something to consider, if you don't want to take on that ability, find a CNA that you can partner up with, a Linux distribution that provides your software. Um, organizations like Red Hat, GitHub, and Google are kind of de facto uh, CNAs for the ecosystem, so establish contacts so that you can help work with them if a researcher comes harassing you, that you'll have a means to kind of protect and defend yourselves. Have a means of intaking uh, security reports privately. You don't want that a uh, potential zero day posted publicly that the bad guys are monitoring your repositories. They can potentially uh, look at your emails. So have a private means of reporting. GitHub private security uh, advisories and reports are a means of doing that if you're in GitHub. Uh, have a private means to test and create fixes. Don't be doing this in your public repo 
Because as soon as, um, again, the bad guys are monitoring all the source code repositories. As soon as they see some commits that look, smell of security, they'll dive in and uh, get interested and potentially work towards make, developing exploits while you're trying to develop a patch. So have a means to test that and build those fixes privately. Uh, in conclusion, and I might have a minute for questions, um, and I'll be out in the hall if not, uh, be aware that attackers care about open source. They are targeting open source projects and maintainers. Security is important, but I understand it's not necessarily the most important thing to your project. Find ways to adopt techniques and tools to help harden yourself and your downstream from attack. And folks like the OpenSSF have a lot of resources available to help you um, integrate into your project, help get automation to do things more securely. So I probably have time for a question. Sir. So the question was, have we considered integrating uh, static analyzers into the compilers uh, in, or in conjunction with? Uh, yes, we have. The Boggle is a lot of static anal analysis tools are commercial, and there's a fee. And generally, an open source project doesn't have a budget for that. There are some free tools, and we have recommendations on how, um, as part of the security tool belt project, we're talking about how you can integrate these tools and automate them into your workflow. Yeah, we work with the GCC and the Clang folks. All that we have a, the compiler hardening guy. We're working with them on that. So yeah, 